Recent videos have discussed different types of bridge circuits, such as the Wheatstone Bridge, the Maxwell Bridge, and the Veen Bridge. And the last video in particular tried to highlight some practical applications of different bridge circuits. In this video, we'll look at a vintage Heathkit RLC bridge, the IB5281, which was an instrument that could measure unknown inductors, capacitors, and resistors based on known standards incorporated into the instrument. So, let's get started. The IB5281 was sold in the 1970s and the 1980s, and it was meant to be an affordable bridge for hobbyists and service technicians. That said, as we'll demonstrate shortly, it was capable of pretty good performance and accuracy, even compared to modern LC meters that are based on digital approaches to measuring inductance and capacitance. This unit followed me home recently. It's in very good shape, and I haven't had to replace anything, though it was necessary to clean some switch contacts, change the batteries, of course, and lubricate the selector and range switch. The circuit consists of a transistor-based Veen bridge oscillator, which oscillates at three frequencies between 1 and 100 kilohertz. These different frequencies are needed for different inductance and capacitance measurements. The oscillator provides AC for the simple bridge, which uses resistance in one arm and either a resistance, inductance, or capacitance in the other arm of the bridge. The circuit's a little bit more complicated, but the basics are given in the manual. Essentially consider a simple Wheatstone bridge, where we have two resistances, R1 and R2, and then two impedances, Z3 and Z4. The Zs can be either resistance or inductive or capacitive in nature. Z4 is our unknown, and the balance condition is that Z4 is to Z3 as R1 is to R2. And we showed that in the last video. So we can rewrite that, of course, to be Z4 is equal to R1 over R2 times Z3. Or in other words, the unknown impedance, Z4, is just the known impedance, Z3, scaled by the ratio of the two resistances, R1 to R2. We can make that a little bit more intuitive by considering an example where Z is inductive. We know that the impedance for an unknown inductor, in this case, will be the square root of the resistance of that inductor squared, times the quantity 2 pi FL squared, where 2 pi FL is the inductive reactance. Well, the above equation just tells us then that that's equal to R1 over R2 times the analogous thing for the known inductor L3, R3 squared plus quantity 2 pi FL3 squared. Well, if the resistances now are negligible compared to the reactances of those two inductors, then you can neglect those, and you're left in the case of the inductors of the unknown L4 equaling L3 times the ratio of R1 to R2. So picking the ratio of these things and making those adjustable is really important. And that's what the engineers at Heathkit did when they engineered this bridge. So beyond the simple Wheatstone bridge-like architecture of this instrument, there was another circuit that amplified and then rectified the current flowing across the bridge in order to identify the desired null in the bridge. This unit can make an absolute measurement based on an internal set of known values of R, L, and C, or relative measurements based on an external component that a user might want to match, for example. And that component would have been plugged in right here. Let's demonstrate how this bridge works. So it's powered by two 9-volt batteries, which are internal. And I can tell you, just playing around on the bench a little bit with this over the last week, that this really eats up batteries quickly. <laughs> so the first thing that you do is you turn this on and this ZS is for an external source. We're not going to do that yet. Let's, uh, let's set this for capacitance and you adjust the null here so that it's not pegging the meter. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to test a capacitor that we know is 0. 2 microfarads. So we're just going to plug in a couple banana plugs. All right, like that. And we've got these over here. We're going to clip our capacitor in just like that. All right. I'm going to set it down here. So the next thing that you do is you set the meter so that it's uh, very 
uh, very high over here on the right. And you now adjust this so that you get a null. Okay, so we're approaching the null. And we've just gone past the null, so... All right. And so this over here on this, uh, the A label, let me just zoom in a little bit here so you can see it. All right. So that reads um, between 15 and 20. And the scale here is times 0 0.01 microfarad. Okay. So that would be between 0 0.15 and 0 0.2 microfarad. Next thing that you do is you readjust the level so that you are able to get better precision on finding the null. So we're going to adjust this a little bit more and we've gone past it so I'm going to go back down. The null is right about there. And now if we pan back over here and zoom in you can see that we've corrected the first measurement and it's now right around 20, just shy of 20. And so when you multiply that by 0.01 microfarad, in fact, you get 0.2 microfarad, which is exactly what the uh, capacitor is advertised to be. It's what it's labeled as, right? So that's pretty impressive. So let's, uh, let's do another one. But let's go down a decade. So instead of 0.2 microfarad, let's go to 0.02 microfarad. So let's go down two decades. That's one decade. I'm uh, math challenged today. Okay, so here we go. We've hooked this up. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to adjust this so that we peak that up. All right, and... Right about there's our null. All right, and now we're going to adjust the level up there. Okay, and you see here that we're off scale. Okay, so you can't really make a quantitative measurement out of that. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to go up. And we've just pegged our meter here. I apologize for having this at an angle. It's the only way I can avoid getting a glare. So what we're going to do is we're going to adjust this so that we, okay, have that there at a more sane reading. And we're going to look for the null. Okay, it's right about there's the null. And we're going to now increase the meter again. Okay, and we're going to look for a better null. And it looks like we're zeroing right about there. So let's just zero in on the scale there. And now we see we're at 200, but it's times 0 0.0001 microfarad, which gives us 0 0.02 microfarad for the value of the capacitor. Let's, uh, let's try something a little bit more challenging now. Let's go down and let's try this capacitor, which is, I know, a 20 picofarad capacitor. All right, so we've hooked it up here and we're now going to put this on the picofarad scale. All right, we're going to make this meter go back up to there and we're going to look for the null and there's that let's peek that up a little bit more and find look for the null again and it's really sharp so it looks like here uh, I won't zoom in again and make you seasick that we're reading about 60 picofarads which is anywhere near the advertised 20 picofarad that we had on the capacitor. 
So you scratch your head and you say, wow, it must be off on the picofarad scale. And the answer is, well, no, no, it's not. What's going on here? Well, <clears throat> what's going on here is that I've got a patch cord that's, oh, the better part of a meter long, and it's two parallel wires. So it's a capacitor. And if we simply take the patch cord off and hold the capacitor in here, like so, and now we're going to readjust the meter, and we're going to look for the null, and it's right about there. So I'm going to peak the meter up a little bit more, look for the null again, more sensitive. It's right about there. And if you now look at the meter, you see it's just a shade over 20. So it's maybe 22, 23 picofarad. So the moral of the story on measuring small value capacitors is that the leads matter. And in fact, what a lot of people do is they construct banana plugs that uh, attach to alligator clips. Okay, and so that's what I did here. Um, I won't belabor the point. You can, and I have verified that it works, you can measure inductors as well as resistors on this. And uh, and it's pretty, it's pretty accurate. Uh, you get you know, pretty accurate values and pretty precise uh, values when you repeat the measurement. This is a, a nice little instrument. You know, I'm really pleased that the unit was taken care of and was found in such good condition. I can't imagine anyone in their right mind using a bridge to measure resistors when DMMs, of course, are so available. But one could imagine scenarios where this sort of an instrument uh, is used to measure capacitance or inductance. I like my little DE 5000 meter. It's showed up in previous videos. But you know, you could imagine that if you drop it and break it, or if it's out of batteries, or if, you know, some calamity befells it, you know, in a pinch and it's late at night and you need to sort out capacitors or identify which inductor is right for your circuit, this probably would do just fine. Well, there are other LC meters, of course, uh, ranging from the very inexpensive uh, to costing lots of money. And there are other similar bridges, of course, that people find useful as well. I'll try to link in a couple websites and YouTube videos that discuss other bridges, just to give you a taste. I hope you found this useful. If so, please uh, leave a big thumbs up below. And as always, thanks for watching.